Electric guitar is like an artist's brush or a sculptor's clay. It's an expression of human beings' desire to reach out with their senses. It expands our sense of hearing, sight, touch, even taste. That is, if you play with your teeth. Hey, I'm Kevin Bacon. Like a lot of you, I love guitars. If you're a player, you already know what I'm talking about. The way they look, the way the strings feel under your fingers, it's almost as if they're alive. <laughs> play the instrument, then the instrument plays you. When you're really in the zone, it's like God is playing it. You know, you're just the conduit. So where does this passion come from and the power? Why do normal, rational people mortgage their homes to afford a particular vintage Les Paul or a Stratocaster? Why would a middle-aged guy in rural New Hampshire vault more than 2,000 of them in his barn? And why do players make those strange, contorted, ecstatic, orgasmic faces when playing solos. This is the story of the electric guitar. From the invention in the 1930s to its golden years, right through the digital guitars of the future. We're gonna meet all kinds of people from rock stars and teenage virtuosos to congressmen, CEOs, in an attempt to understand their emotional connection to their guitars. The electric guitar is magic. It it goes beyond cultures, it goes beyond words, it goes beyond language. It is a pulsing, rhythmic connection to the essential forces of the universe. See, what they all have in common is their passion for the instrument and the quest to find their own personal tone. You go through this, this long, never-ending journey, and you also have the aid of the whole commercial aspect of the guitar business to help you along so that you can work your ass off to spend all your money trying to fucking find the end of this quest. United States guitar market looking at about $7.82 billion and $17 billion worldwide. Every shape, size, color, texture, design that you can find, you know, you'll find here at the halls of the NAMM show. It really is an amazing instrument. Guitar Center in Hollywood rocks day and night. You can buy just about any new guitar. But way back in the vintage room, a room that used to be the Groucho Marx Theater, the Burst Brothers reign. Drew Berlin and Dave Belzer are two of the world's top experts on vintage guitars, and the vintage room contains most of them. How did it all begin? 
This is called a Rickenbacker frying pan. It's probably the first electric guitar type instrument made in 1932 came solid, out. Solid body, that's it's, for sure, with a pickup. It's a piece of metal, metal body, metal one piece body neck type of thing. Um, it's got the Rickenbacker pickup in it, which sounds pretty. <laughs> Sounds pretty cool. For the most part, the, the guitar player was kind of like next to the hi-hat. You know, his job was playing rhythm parts, very little lead, because you couldn't hear him. As soon as somebody put a pickup on the guitar, the guitar all of a sudden could speak. It went from being a background instrument and became a solo instrument. And Charlie Christian was the first person to do this. Benny Goodman had a black guy, one of the first black guys that was in a white band called Charlie Christian. And boy, did I like that. This pickup is the first pickup that was used on an electric guitar, apart from the Rickenbacker frying pan. Charlie Christian was playing one of these in 1936. And uh, this is the pickup that made the sound possible. <laughs> The sweetest music this side of heaven to me was that electric guitar. I wanted to be a preacher and play guitar. Part of the popularity of the guitar is, I'm sure, with three chords, um, you can pretty much play 90% of all the songs you ever had to play. You can make a whole career of that, three chords. And then you plug it into a guitar amplifier where your voice is the loudest voice in a room of either 1, 50, 500, 5,000, 50,000. It's an interesting dynamic begins to happen. Once you can jack up the volume, then you can be heard across <laughs> in the next county. It gives you a lot of power. technology of being able to, you know, plug into plug into the lightning in the sky, <laughs> you, know, you know, and feel the fury of it. I mean, there's there's still nothing better than standing in front of a fucking stack, man, and hitting a chord and having it like move you, yeah. you know, you just you can you can feel it hit you in the back, man. There's nothing like that. It's an instrument that uh, will always win because you can always crank it up. <laughs> Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp is a chance for anyone to be a rock star for a week. Musicians of all ages and abilities sign up for a one-week program where campers rediscover their passion for music and the guitar. They audition, bands are formed, each of which has a rock star teacher play. Then they have five days to learn the material and perfect their performance. In the process, they form a team. And on the fifth and final day, the bands travel to Hollywood's House of Blues where they compete in a battle of the bands in front of the public and their families. No pressure there. But today is day one, when the campers arrive, get to know each other, and audition for the counselors who assign them to bands. I think George Thorogood said it best in this room. He said, if anyone born after 1950 ever said that they didn't want to be a rock star, they're lying. Jim I wanted to be a rock star. I went to business instead, but I had it in me. And that's why I'm here. This week, I'm a rock star. It's fun as hell. My name is Greg Burns. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm a professor of neuroscience. 
I kind of got to the point in my career where you know I had put the guitar away for many years since high school, and then the guitar is sitting there in the corner. It called to me, and I picked it up again. It brought back a lot of great memories. You take normal people that play in their basement, love the music, love the instruments, and they come here and they get to play with people that have been through this. Like Jeff Baxter, you know, I play Doobie Brothers song. I play China Grove probably a couple times a week. Paul Stanley, to get a chance to see him growing up listening to Kiss. Dickie Betts, without a question. <laughs> rock and roll. This week is what it's all about. I mean, I like the noise and the power of rock and roll. I like the out of controlness of it. I like the ugliness of it, and I like the beauty of it, you know, and I get that all from the guitar, you know. To me, you pick up a guitar, and whatever's on your mind that you want to get out there, you can do it through guitar. The guitar sort of, for me, becomes an extension of my voice. It'll say the things for me that I don't know how to say sometimes. I can be as aggressive, I can do whatever. All the things I can't do verbally, I can express on the guitar, <laughs> whether they get it or not, you know. <laughs> While filming Les Paul in New York, there was word on the street about a teenage girl from Long Island who was incredibly gifted. We caught up with her at Pi Studios in Glen Cove, New York. Kristen Capolino has truly found her voice through her guitar, a Gibson Flying V. When I was little, I had a hard time expressing myself. I think I went through some difficult times when I was young, so I felt like that was the best way to express like my sadness mostly, but at the same time, to express my happiness through playing. I love it like an electric guitar. You can really just feel it. You can really place your emotion into it. When I play, I feel like it like releases all my pain into another world. Like it takes you somewhere. It's like a euphoria. people hear the name Les Paul, they typically think of the guitar. But Les is also a man. He was one of the greatest players of all time. But Les may be more famous for his contribution as an inventor. Some call him the father of the solid body electric guitar and multi-track recording. And it all started because he wanted to be heard. I got a job on a Saturday night, one of my first jobs, to play for the cars that came in the Beekman's barbecue stand. A fellow drove up in a rumble seat, and he wrote a note to the car hop saying, Red, your guitar is not loud enough. So I tried to take the pick up from a phonograph and jab the needle in the top of the guitar, then I got feedback. So I decided I'm going to go with a piece of railroad track. And so I placed a string on the piece of railroad track. I plucked the guitar, and when I heard this piece of railroad track sound like something from another planet, and I said, oh my goodness, how wonderful that sounds. And Mother says, wait a minute. The day you see a cowboy on a horse <laughs> playing with a railroad truck. <laughs> so I said, it's got to be a piece of wood. Well, I started with a 4x4, four four, and I thought everybody would fall over. So I put sides on it. And I have another side here. I and mean, this is what the sides look like. And these sides just plug on it here and you screw them on, then you go on your job and you play it. And so we call this the log. 
And because of the log, uh, the solid body came about. <laughs> I can't imagine my life without a guitar in it. And what it brings to me, which is a rock band and a life of art and music. Once you get into the guitar, it becomes part of your identity. Meet Sean Costello from Atlanta. Sean plays a Les Paul, a recreation of the 1956 Gold Top model. We filmed him at the Viper Room on the Sunset Strip. Oh, it's changed my life in every way. I mean, it's become sort of my identity in some ways. Like, because I started playing so young and became successful, I was a shy kid, very, very shy. Not a good athlete, not really great with the ladies at first, you know? So it really helped me in, in every way, just establish confidence in myself. I mean, I can't imagine what my life would be like without it. the guitar player ends and where I actually begin. You know, I think it's kind of I'm one and the same at this point. I'd say the guitar saved my life. It's taken me a lot of places <laughs> that I never would have gone. It made me an honorary professor. <laughs> this would never have happened if I didn't play guitar. When I finally did get all six strings and I learned like my first sort of pentatonic lick, I, was, I felt like I'd arrived. I mean, I touched on something that mm -hmm. changed me forever. In 1949, along came a man called Leo Fender has changed the face of the electric guitar forevermore. Leo Fender, despite not being a player, was an exceptional engineer and a great listener. Fender's Telecaster was the first successful solid body electric guitar. It debuted in 1949. It took a while to catch on, but it definitely did. There's something very Americana about an electric guitar. I mean, especially a solid body guitar, because it is manufactured pretty much in the same way as an automobile is. Leo Fender had this idea that you didn't need to have a neck that was actually glued onto the body. This was the great innovation. It was called the plank. This guitar can be taken apart and put back together in minutes. You unbolt these four bolts, the neck comes off. You unscrew these two screws, the control cavity comes off. In 1949, everybody thought it was a joke but uh, Leo Fender had the last laugh. Leo and I had a, we took one of those first broadcasters one night, went into Los Angeles to a place called Riverside Rancho. Leo, Fender, and George uh, basically had this guitar that they could not sell. Nobody was buying it because they weren't familiar with a solid body guitar. It's never been done before. So they were kind of looking for somebody to, to play this thing. There was a young fellow who came in, a good looking young guy, and, came over where we were standing, and he saw our guitar sitting there, and he wanted to know what kind of guitar it was, and said, well, it's, it's something new we've been working on. And he said, could I see it? And I said, certainly, that's why we brought it. And he said, well, can I play it? Never in my life have I ever heard like these two fellows are individually. You put them together, and boy, you've got the very best. Here we go with Jimmy Bryant, Speedy West, and Fly It High. <laughs> He played at least two hours on that guitar that night, and everybody just loved it. They never went back to dancing. The band didn't go back to playing. They just listened to this young man play. That was the fabulous Jimmy Bryant. 
The first commercially successful solo body guitars were definitely Fenders. And we're talking about something that really, really caught on quickly. I mean, you can play a Fender as loud as you want. I think that's really one of the reasons Fenders were so popular in the early 50s. The Telecaster really got it going, you know, and it just had this sonic specialty that is unequaled. Some real hot licks were played on this guitar. <laughs> It's a great guitar. I mean, when you can really dig into it and it still keeps the clarity and... Uh... And, you know, you pick up new guitars and they don't, they just don't sound like that to me. When I was growing up, I loved Keith Richards and I loved country music and things like that. And uh, they always played Telecasters and I always wanted a Telecaster like Keith Richards. He had a a blonde Telecaster with a beautiful black guard. I finally got a Telecaster like when I was probably around 13 or so. I think the guitar really kind of chose me. You know, I just play all the time. I think that's what keeps me kind of sane. You know, I have terrible anxiety and things like that, so I just play and just keep my mind off things. And when I don't, you know, I just get real mean and stuff like that. It's made my life wonderful, and I'm making a living playing guitar, which I would do it for free anyways, but, you know, don't tell my bosses that. But also, it can ruin a lot of lives as well, just like, you know, alcohol or drugs or anything like that, because I play so much. When you pick your guitar over your, you know, wife, it's not always the best thing. Is that cool? You can definitely be addicted to the guitar because when I went on my honeymoon, not only did I take my guitar, but I took my guitar tech too, so. At least he gave me a towel when I needed one. At first, Gibson laughed at the Telecaster. After years of making finely crafted archtop instruments, this plank concept looked like amateur hour to them until people started to play it and buy it. And suddenly, Gibson needed to compete in this new area. So they called on our old friend, Les Paul. The guitars they created together are some of the finest ever made. The introduction of the Les Paul began a 50-year sales war between Fender and Gibson that continues today. went on, it made it more lovable, beautiful, until it was a bartender, a mistress, a housewife. It was everything that you could think of, and there was something that you could love, and it would do what you tell it to do sometimes. <laughs> Les Paul came up with this absolute masterpiece. It's called Les Paul Standard Gold Top. This was the, the very, very first Gibson solid body guitar. This guitar has a switch, so the bass pickup, just this pickup sounds like this. In the middle, both pickups sound like this. The bridge, lead pickup. Notice I have this guitar all the way up volume-wise, and it's not making a lot of noise. Where this guitar, if I turn it up, and that's the difference between the single coil and the humbucker. 
Well, I'm sort of a Les Paul girl. I've always liked that more of a growly, dirty, fat, powerhouse kind of sound. Maybe it's an overcompensation on my part, you know, from being a, a girl or something. When I play the guitar, it takes me to an amazing place where time disappears. You could be anywhere, you could be any age, you could be almost anyone. It's beyond your own self, it's out of body. I love my guitar. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing says rock and roll and sex like a low-strung, low-hung electric guitar. It's hard to hug a Steinway. It's a sort of romantic thing, isn't it? When you hold something close and you get beautiful sounds to come out of it. I think the electric guitar, I mean, there's no doubt that there's a shape that is a symbol of something sexy. I, I gotta say that. But I'm not saying I picked up a guitar just because I was horny. It's a perfect illustration. Here we have a vase. Put an echo on this thing. What does it remind you of? <laughs> it's got great curves. The knobs are fun to twiddle with. It's really soft on the line and it totally ties into the art of the female body. And I just think it's a romantic instrument. You know, you, you touch it, it's this feel of the wood, the strings, it vibrates against your body. None of the other instruments are, are instruments that you hold to your chest, to your heart. Musicians feel a tremendous relationship with their instruments, sometimes maybe to the point of an attraction. This guitar is very special. I play it and it's like making love to it. I've never told anybody this. I literally play this guitar and I will start drooling. I don't know what it is, but the first time I touched it, I felt something through it. It's connected me to it. It's very hard to explain, but it's love. You fall in love suddenly. You don't know. It just hits you, you know? Now a serious competition from Gibson's Les Paul. It was time for Fender to respond and take it to the next level. The Stratocaster was so modern, was so radical, looked out of place in the bandstands in the 1950s. But rock and roll changed all that. And many legendary musicians quickly adopted the strat. It's no coincidence that the Fender Stratocaster and rock were born at exactly the same point in history. The guitar that did it for most people in England was uh, Buddy Holly's Stratocaster. To sing it on the cover of that Chirping Crickets record, it just looked fantastic. They had a magic about them, you know, you see these pictures of Americans playing these great guitars, you know. This is a Stratocaster. It was a spaceship compared to anything that had appeared at that time. This is the sexiest, most curvaceous instrument that's ever come on this planet. This is sex with strings on it. It just was a guitar that seemed to be a huge leap tonally. The Stratocaster, by adding the third pickup, really added to the tonal spectrum. It's the front pickup, a little more mellower. The middle pickup is a little brighter. A little raspier sound, and then a brighter sound in the back pickup. This is very similar to a very famous guitar called Blackie that was sold by Eric Clapton a while ago for nearly a million dollars. Now, an interesting thing about the Stratocaster, which is a big part of Eric Clapton's sound, is he would do a little trick, which was actually putting the switch right in between these two pickups. <laughs> And 
you get a little out of phase sound. Which was the sound of, you know, Lay Down Sally and, you know, Slow Hand, the Slow Hand album, or starting even with, you know, when he hooked up with Delaney and Bonnie and Derek and the Dominoes is really when he went from a Gibson to a Strat. It was just my guitar always. I tried all kinds of guitars and I always come back to Strat. That's the, the only guitar that inspires me. I had this fascination since I was a kid, maybe because it was forbidden for me to touch it. My dad was really influenced by American blues music and American sound, and he had a lot of jam sessions back home in Serbia. And I grew up listening to this kind of music since I was two or three years old. And I just wanted to play blues. I just, I just really wanted to go into electric stuff. I was really trying hard to sound like Howling Wolf when I was 13. That was a bad idea. A guitar is the way that our souls speak. I think maybe the best comment that I ever got from my audience was when they come to see me, they all come home thinking that playing guitar is the best and that we should all become guitar players. Wild thing! Whenever I listen to Gary play the guitar, I always have a glass of wine. house just kind of shakes. Uh, no one has complained, uh, that I know of at least. Nobody tells them to be quiet, or, except if our kids are at home. <laughs> my wife and daughters aren't real impressed with my uh, guitar playing skills. And the girls would go, Dad, you know, turn it down. This is embarrassing. You know, it's not about them. It's about me when we're playing guitar. To be CEO for a company like Southwest Airlines is terrific. You enjoy your flight. Uh, but the airline industry is tough, and our assets lie at 35,000 feet, 500 miles an hour. So it's just not for the faint of heart. And it's also a, a seven-day-a-week business, uh, which often translates into near 24 hours a day. So I have a lot of outside interest, and I'm just starved for time. So I like to play guitar, obviously. It's just a way to relax, and a way to take my mind off other things. And even, uh, you know, if it's just for a few minutes, it's still great. It's just a great joy. called scoliosis. So I was in a back cast for 14 months when I was a kid and a back brace for two years, which is when I started to learn to play guitar. You don't really get a lot of dates when you get a full body cast on. You try, but you really don't get them. So, you know, it was really the guitar was around all the time and ended up being like my best friend. I mean, it's the longest relationship that I have on earth is with my guitar other than my mother and father. I've been in situations in my life where I've, I feel like I've been through a lot where, you know, the only thing I had was the guitar. The only thing that, that I could count on was the guitar. It's kept me out of a lot of trouble is what it's done. I went from an anonymous dork to like somebody who was kind of cool and uh, changed my whole life. Because I was kind of a nerdy kid, you know. I was never uh, the most popular in school or anything like that until I started playing the guitar. I used to go over to my buddy's house and his brother had a guitar. And you know, just a crummy nylon string guitar. but. I picked that up and somehow I really felt something there. I, I knew I could play that thing. When I first started playing guitar, I was playing flamenco guitar. You know, I never really thought about playing electric guitar until I went to see Chuck Berry play one time. He was like the devil with his guitar and just the way he looked at you, it was like the devil with his pitchfork, you know? I just knew I had to get one of those red guitars. I think my 
my style is a combination of being in the doors and trying not to sound like anybody else. I kind of had to play bass, rhythm, lead, all those things at once, you know, so it made me play a certain way. And I really hadn't played electric guitar for more than three or four months, you know, when I got in the doors. At one point, Jim was writing everything, and we didn't really have enough songs, you know, so Jim says, hey, why don't you guys try and write some too, you know? So I went home, and the next day I wrote Light My Fire. Playing the guitar is, it's, I guess it's like an escape for me, just the way those strings feel, you know? It just makes me feel a certain way. It makes me feel good, let me put it that way. And, and uh, the more you play, the better you feel. It's like a drug. It's just like a drug, only it's legal. Gibson's ES series was the brainchild of Ted McCarty, Gibson's president in the 50s and 60s. It was first produced in 1958. It was a breakthrough design because it has a solid maple block inside. The ES has the attributes of a solid body, like less feedback. But its resonance chambers give it the chime of a hollow body instrument. It's a great all-around guitar that is played and copied by just about everyone. Very fundamental two pickups. You can get a nice rock and roll sound out of it too without feeding back. So it's, it's, it's got the chiminess of the pickups, it's got the brightness of the neck, and it just looks spectacular. <laughs> historically played an ES-355, but more recently developed his own version of Lucille. Phoebe's variation has no F-holes to further reduce feedback, along with other modifications. Can't take credit for it. I may have helped improve it a little. <laughs> I didn't create it. Anyone that bends a note on the guitar and holds it, and anyone that shakes a note like that, is getting it from B.B. King, whether they know it or not. I trill my hand like this, if you can see, just like that. That's all I do. But I've learned to do it well enough so it moves the string a little. To me, the guitar is, is the most expressive instrument because you can bend those strings and you get in between the notes. The guitar, to me, is the instrument of infinity. It's the instrument of your soul. It goes through your heart, through your mind, through your genitals to what's in your core in the middle. In an organ and piano, you've got notes you have to hit, but on a guitar, you can play the infinity between the notes. Playing slide on a guitar is like what life is about. I mean, it's not where you are, but it's about how you get there. Without question, the most collectible guitar in the world is the 1959 Les Paul. It's considered the holy grail of electrics. The 59s are super rare and super expensive. At Pi Studios, Kristen Capolino had a life-changing opportunity to play a 1959 Les Paul standard. And to further elevate the experience, she played it through a Marshall amp that Jimi Hendrix used to record many of his classics. Gibson in the late 50s reached a pinnacle of craftsmanship and materials that just came together where they made a guitar that, you know, the best players in the world desire, the Stradivarius of electric guitars. The Les Paul flame top, this particular type of guitar, has always been the pinnacle of collectible guitars, in my opinion. This guitar has a lot of book match flame, which makes it very desirable. 
These are played by all the great artists, everybody from Joe Walsh to Jimmy Page, Jeff Beck, everybody. Even Clapton played one of these at one time. They're fantastic guitars. Les Paul Sunburst guitar. It's one of the greatest uh, rock and roll guitars ever made, and I've enjoyed uh, playing one for years and years. And when the Butterfield Band went to Europe in 66, I noticed that Peter Green was playing a uh, red Les Paul like this. Clapton was playing one. And I wondered to myself, how did they know that this guitar had all the inherent qualities of sustain, volume, and tone that was just better than any other possible uh, rock and roll guitar at that time? There's probably 20, 25 important things that affect the sound of a guitar pickup. There are so many variables in the shape, how it produces the magnetic field around the string area. That's what generates the current that you hear that goes into the amplifier. I was very lucky to have you know, studied ham radio and stuff like that to understand what it's all about. You know, I mean, I can hear it, but what is it that I'm hearing? You know, and I want to be able to produce it and understand that if I use this many turns or this kind of winding pitch, how close each wire is together. There's hundreds and hundreds of wiring combinations, and I've done so many of them that I, I, can, I, can, I can really hear the difference. Seymour Duncan originally started rewinding pickups for uh, guitar players when he was in London, England, and this probably would have been the mid-60s, I'm gonna guess. And so I think he just became obsessed with helping people achieve better guitar tone. Having Seymour Duncan pickups in your guitar, you're putting something in your, in your guitar that basically goes back to the beginning of rock and roll. He you know, worked with Hendrix. He worked you know, with Jeff Beck, of course, uh, Jimmy Page. So all these great players, he helped them achieve the sounds they were going for. has an uncanny ability to be able to translate someone describing what they want in sound, in words. Like warm sounding or bright or tight, there's a lot of terms that are used to describe a pickup. To get, get to the science, you have to have the magic or the, the mindset to understand where you're coming from. So finding a pickup that has a tone that's to your liking it's so important. It's, it's just a very important part of playing. It's a very important to what you hear, and it's a tone that you produce that makes other people appreciate what you're doing, too. Down through the history of man, items have been symbols connected to people and events that either have magical powers or have some significance. The electric guitar was a magic carpet that propelled the youth of America to another place and another time. The bolt of lightning struck us when we saw the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show, actually. All My Loving from the Beatles, that's the first rock song, pop song I ever heard, and I was sold. And I immediately decided I want an electric guitar. The reason why I started playing the guitar was because of the Beatles. I mean, like anybody my age, you know, that moment when the, on the Ed Sullivan Show in 1964 changed everybody's life. They hooked me. I actually started playing acoustic guitar. I started playing folk guitar and uh, graduated after a while to uh, electric guitar. Lots of politicians play electric guitar. John Kerry, Mike Huckabee, Tony Blair, the late Tony Snow, and our friend Congressman Paul Hodes of New Hampshire. I'm sort of a basic rock and roller, you know, if it's got a couple of chords and I can play a pentatonic scale, I'm a happy guy. There's a powerful current that I feel flowing through me when I play the guitar. It comes from up there and it goes through me and it is a very powerful thing. 
How else can you make so much loud noise, have so much fun, and have it be artful if you're good at it? At Fantasy Camp, we discovered another teenage virtuoso named Jared Staden from North Carolina. But Jared's already a pro musician at the age of 16. Why is powerfully obvious when he plays. I was hooked on guitar on my 13th birthday, which is the day I started playing. Dad pulled me into our computer room and uh, said, listen to this, and he started playing The Ocean by Led Zeppelin. And the second I heard that song, I, I knew right then and there what I had to do. I gotta have music in my future. If I don't, I won't be happy. The electric guitar has made some pretty bold statements yeah. since its inception. This is your gun, but it is a gun for peace. This is the instrument of the individual. As soon as you held your guitar, you were sending a strong message to the system. And I believe that during the 60s and 70s when rock and roll began, we musicians, entertainers, was able to bring more people together than the politicians. In the end, why we, Hungarians, Poles, Czechs, and Russians brought down the communist system is because of rock and roll and blue jeans. This is the way you get to freedom right here. Now, as a symbol, I would say the guitar is very powerful. When somebody holds up an AK-47, you know exactly what that means. When somebody holds up an electric guitar, there is no question in your mind what that means. This means freedom. This means war killing. Freedom to express freedom to communicate your deepest and innermost feelings from your soul to your fellow human beings. In a world where people are afraid of free will, this machine is unknown and frightening. In the right hands, the guitar can change the world. My love for guitars started in Bangladesh. It started with four of us friends, you know, listening to Iron Maiden. When we were like uh, 15, we started this band, rock music. And being in a Muslim country, it's not really accepted. So you have to hide and do stuff. We did an album. In a year, it was being played everywhere. You see kids jamming to it and stuff, and you go, oh my god, that's us. Nobody knew what we looked like. We didn't put any pictures on the album, just to be safe. So, we do a concert. Curtain drops. 35,000 people cheering for us. And then it got really weird. It's a Muslim country. And not certain people didn't like that. We couldn't play certain venues anymore. We can't do certain things anymore. Had to be very careful walking down the streets and we have families. But the biggest thing of all, music, I I guitar, is now I hold it and I see it was hope. Because little kids will look at you, they'll write to you, they'll find you, and they will tell you, you did it, you went there. And you know, you know I wanna be there, I can do it too. I can speak through that and tell the whole world that I exist and I have this beautiful thing in me, you know? I can express myself. what 
inspiration does, you know? Those, all those kids are inspired by us. Walter, this is one that was just brought in. In fact, it came in while I was at lunch. With the instruments, I can't truly tell you what things are going to be worth. That's in spite of the fact that I appraise guitars daily. The guitar described below is, in our opinion, a Gibson Les Paul Gold Top model made early in the year 1957, description serial number 7 space 0232. The peg head has been cracked lengthwise. It matters very much on condition, whether it's been monkeyed with or not. Now, this is one that, uh, if it hadn't been messed over here, it would be at least an $80,000 guitar. Current market value after repair of the peg head, $50,000. If you look at the 1959 guitar, one of the reasons it's worth a lot of money is because we sold all of 300 on a global basis. And let me tell you, that was not a big number for Gibson. By 1960, Gibson decided to cease production of the Les Paul, and that's when people like Eric Clapton and Mike Bloomfield discovered them. More accurately, Clapton saw Freddie King playing a gold top and wanted a similar vibe. So almost immediately, demand exceeded the supply, and vintage Les Pauls started getting valuable. They didn't want the new Gibsons. They wanted those old ones, and the sound was as different as night and day. <laughs> I got this guitar probably early uh, 67, once I had enough money to start buying guitars. I think I paid $400 to a friend named Rocky for this guitar. I don't know where he got it. There was a period in the 60s well, while the young kid was running up and down the street to get a Les Paul, Gibson was at the same time selling off all their equipment and thinking that the phase is over, that it was going to go to synthesizers. They were going to discard the electric guitar. After the demise of the Les Paul in 1960, the Strat and the Telly soldiered on and rode a wave of enthusiasm during the early Beatles era. But in the mid-1960s, newer guitars, like the Fender Jazzmaster and Jaguar, began to steal the older guitar's thunder, especially with the surf crowd. In 1967, Fender was ready to cease production of the Stratocaster. Then one man single-handedly saved the Strat and maybe the electric guitar. I first drank the Kool-Aid when I saw Jimi Hendrix at the Framingham Carousel in 1968. That just blew my mind. I knew at that point in time, all I wanted was Fender Stratocaster. The Stratocaster is today an icon. It's the most popular guitar on the planet, with almost 100 models to choose from, not counting the ripoffs. It's so ingrained in our culture that it inspired a roller coaster at Disney World in Florida. <laughs> I'm definitely a guitar addict, you know. I've just been a guitar player for the last 42 years, and I've pretty much played the guitar every single day. You know, I can count the days I don't play the guitar in, a, in the course of a year, I can count the days on one hand.
I'm so passionate about playing and I, I want to express that passion and my own personal joy and exhilaration through the guitar because I think I find my center as a person when I'm playing. Because it's really the only thing I can do. I can barbecue, but I can play guitar better than I barbecue. <laughs> a number of factors combined to create the vintage guitar market. One was the scarcity of the early models like the Les Paul and the Flying V and the ES series, even the early Strats. The other was the fact that both Gibson and Fender were bought by giant corporations. Fender by massive CBS and Gibson by an Ecuadorian cement company. To begin around 1966 or so, the guitars began to suffer from reduced quality and inferior sound. By the early 70s, most were junk compared to what had come before. The musicians began to realize that the new guitars just didn't feel or sound right. The corporate bean counters had done their jobs too well. Guitars back then were made by the people for the people, you know. Then it got into, a, I think, a monetary thing where they had to make more of them in less time. So they started automating more, and a lot of the steps, the final little sanding here, or this over here, or um, I think a lot of that, the personal touch, got lost. Been playing a Les Paul for a pretty long time, and the first electric guitar that I ever got was a Les Paul. But that one was such a piece of, piece of shit that after about a year, I remember I stuck it neck first through a wall. <laughs> Things got so bad by the mid 80s that Gibson was weeks away from shutting its doors. And then Henry Juskowitz and his partners acquired Gibson in a last minute attempt to save the company. They used technology and perfectionism to revive the brand. And gradually, the new instruments improved in quality. But are they really as good as the old ones? I was nonplussed by the fact that our employees didn't think the guitars were any good. Many of them were playing Fenders. And I said, man, that's just not right. I took a guitar and I smashed it in the ground. I said, every guitar that has Gibson on it that's not right is going to be destroyed. And you know what? The guitar started getting a lot better and the employees started playing Gibson product. In hindsight, it looks like all Gibson had to do was look on the stages of, of rock and roll and they could see everybody's playing the Les Paul. If you look at the electric guitar, in principle, the first ones are exactly as they are today, the Telecaster, the Stratocaster, the Les Paul. They just got it right. It's completely timeless. Both Gibson and Fender are copying very, very closely what they made in the 50s and early 60s. Since maybe 90s, when Gibson dissected a real burst from the 50s, they made the correct neck joint and the reissue flame tops that they make are particularly good instruments that you can buy new. What we had been doing is exactly what the Kalamazoo factory had done back in the 50s. Of course, they didn't have $100,000 numerical control machines to add to the process, but we have that opportunity. It's beyond just being like the old one. It is a much better guitar today. The old ones don't all sound the same. The pickup windings are different from pickup to pickup. When Seth Lover, who invented the humbucking pickup, was asked how many turns of wire he put on it, so we just ran them till they were full. It is mind-boggling that these relatively inexpensive components of the 50s, combined with inexpensive labor, often enough women who didn't know how to play a single chord on a guitar, winding the pickups, were producing results that today physicists study to try to figure out. And that's part of the, the mystique of the old ones. But as far as recreating the sound, uh, you can come close enough, I think, that in a blindfold test, uh, you couldn't tell. This is 
is a 1954 Les Paul with P90 pickups, a wraparound bridge. And uh, this is their, their, their version nowadays of basically the same guitar. <laughs> Let's listen to the difference. It's so creamy, you know. You can't expect a guitar from 2006 to sound like a guitar from 1955. We have to look at the quality and integrity of things that were made in a different time. People made all these things by hand. And today, guitars are mass produced. They may have made 500 of these a year back then for three years, maybe a little more. Now it's 400 a day. When you get into vintage instruments, you're dealing, I think, with just time. And who knows what impressions time makes on a thing. Vintage versus the new. <laughs> <coughs> There was a time when the guitar was at the forefront of the generation gap, but today, it can be a bridge between generations. Johnny started playing with us, sitting in with us when he was nine years old. And actually, on two of our albums that we got nominated for instrumental Grammys, Johnny was the guitar player, on one of which when he was nine. <laughs> it's a great way to also spend time together, be able to share the, a common passion for music and for guitar playing, keep it in the family and, and play with someone you love and respect too. So we're always hanging out and we're able to you know, hang out and do things that we both care about. So it makes it a lot more fun. He's a solo hog. <laughs> <laughs> been my lifelong dream is to play with him. Come see the smoke and we show. See how he took me out when I was 12 years old, when I just started playing guitar. And I saw a gig, I saw Toto play. Just blew him, and he like, just ripped it up. The fans are going crazy. I was like, I want to be that guy. I want to be my dad. <laughs> so, uh, and I remember the first time I asked, I was like, Dad, man, I want to play guitar. He's like, oh, yeah? I'm like, yeah. And he tuned down my low E to a D, and he put my finger, and it sounded like a power. He's like, have fun, and left the room. <laughs> and I just, you know, it was pretty much it started. <laughs> It's been a kick for me just to see my son, you know, like stand next to him and play and watch him develop. Writing songs together and working in the studios together, you know, doing sessions and whatnot, it's been great fun. Yeah. I mean, my best friend, it just happens to be my son. Give daddy a kiss now. Mm. <laughs> But you can have more than one of these things of beauty, and I, I fall in love all the time. Gas. Gas. We're, we're, yes, gas. Well, <laughs> we're talking about gas, you know? And I try not to pass it that much, but I, I do have it. Oh, I totally have gas. I have gas, yes, I do. I've had guitar acquisition syndrome since I was 16 years old. You just fall in love with something and have to have it. There's times I just have to like, I don't care, I'm taking that home. How much? Okay, I don't care. You know what I mean? It costs a fortune, but God, it's fun. <laughs> I think I've got it fairly under control. I only bought two guitars this week. <laughs> it's true. Well, this is my third Strat that I've had. I always get the sunburst. We've got guitars in every room of the house. How many wives have said, why do you need so many guitars? Well, they all have their own little vibe. I just love to hold them and play them and collect them and look at them, which is why I got over 100 guitars. I just did a photo shoot, so I have 108 guitars, but they're not crap. Now I probably have about 150 guitars. Between guitars, banjos, mandolins, it's around 2,000 guitars. I don't think a man ever has enough guitars. I wonder if I keep buying them, I'm going to be living under the freeway, but I'm going to have a really nice guitar collection. 
I bought a Gibson Les Paul Sunburst from a guitar player in the Hollies. I paid 250 pounds for it. And when I sold it for 500 pounds, I thought, hey, I doubled my money. I had a 54 black uh, Les Paul. A guy I knew said, let me borrow it for the summer. I was young, it was the summer of love. I said, sure, take the guitar for the summer, man. I'll see you back here in school. He took the guitar and traded it for a Harley. I actually had the opportunity to buy the most flamey 60 I've ever seen. This is back in the 70s. The guy wanted $3,000 for it, and I said, are you kidding? That's not worth no $3,000. It'll never be worth that much. Now, this one is $350,000. There are people who've paid over $400,000 for these. Nowadays, one in this condition, uh, you could expect to pay about a half a million dollars for possibly more, sky's the limit. Could have had 12 Harleys. Could have had all of the Harley Davidson company. Should have bought it. Before I just poo-poo the whole idea, we can say that there are people who've paid over a million dollars for the right postage stamp or coin, and the postage stamp is no good to put on an envelope and mail something with it, and the coin is no good to put in a gum machine. <laughs> Hi, this is Brian Fisher from Firebird Farm up in New Hampshire. We primarily grow organic blueberries, but I've been known to grow a few firebirds, Gibson firebirds that is. My main reason of collecting these instruments is that I'd say half of the instruments that I own need to be preserved for generations beyond us. And I just want to make sure that they get into an area where everyone can appreciate them. This is, of course, a 1958 Flying V here with the original tags. They were a, a total failure in the market. They produced approximately 70-some. They just were too modernistic. So it's hard to venture a guess of what a Flying V in this condition would bring. Would it be 200,000 or could it be 500 or 700,000? The old guitars do have a certain mojo and if you don't know what it means, I, I, I can't help you. This guitar here is what Mojo is all about. This is an original 1958 Flying V that I got from a blues guy in Cincinnati named Big Ed Thompson. Nine times out of 10, if you pick up an old guitar and it's been played by somebody who could really play, you get that sense out of the guitar. There's a lot of soul put in there from somebody else who put the time to wear, to wear the paint off right here or have some, some pick pick scratches down here, you know, there's some stories in that guitar. I do like playing my old tellies, you know, it's a, it just get this feeling that this, you know, this guitar is from the 50s and, and uh, you know, it just ha has a, a vibe about it because it's been around for so long. I really believe that certain guitars have a spirit. It's been to a thousand gigs, it's had hundreds and hundreds of hours of playing on just it. Think of all the people who have, who have been entertained by this thing and who have put those good vibes back. You know, it may sound silly. I don't know if it's true or if it's not true, but this guitar here, I have never played another electric guitar, bar none, that sounds better than this. This is the one. And it also has that, that oozing, unmistakable mojo that the old guitars have. <laughs> When the guitar market started getting so crazy where Les Pauls were four or five hundred thousand dollars, you know, Stratocasters were 10, 15, 20, 25,000. All during the like 60s and 70s and 80s, people would change stuff out and put in other hot rodded stuff that maybe would have made it sound different. Or, but it didn't have the look of the old instrument that was retaining so much in value. So I said, you know, I, I got to do something about that. And that's when I came up with the antiquities. And antiquity is the art of making something or quality that is old. So for me, that was important to do. So that all of a sudden became just a great hit. And we do a lot of custom things to them, so they're all different. You're getting a pickup like how it was manufactured 50, 60 years ago. I started with the antiquities, and then Fender came out with the relics, and then Gibson came out with the historics. But we, were, we started all that aging thing. Since not everyone can afford a vintage guitar, and there are only so many to go around, the manufacturers have created 
new guitars that are aged or relict versions of famous axes. This is an exact replica of Stevie Ray Vaughan's number one guitar. And at the time of his death, this is the way that guitar looked. They measured this guitar in every respect and made 100 exact replicas of Stevie's guitar. Relics are also very collectible. Since such a limited amount are produced, they're great investments. So when it comes to relicking, say, Stevie Ray Vaughan's Lenny Stratocaster, every nick and ding, every discoloration, and even the cigarette burns and decals are precisely replicated. It allows the consumer to actually partner with the artist and own exactly what he's had. That's cool. It's a good thing, you know? It's a historical artifact that's very important to the world. And now you're in this improbable position of documenting it. Something that means so much to people, then you're going inside of that. It's a heavy experience. The beauty of this guitar, I've actually played it. You know, the technicians at Fender that made these guitars said, we want people to play them. We want people to be able to feel the same thing Stevie felt. What is a digital guitar? Does it play the same way as a traditional analog guitar? How does it feel? And how can it come so close to sounding like 26 other guitars at the turn of a dial? The Variax guitar, first and foremost, is a musical instrument. The ability now to do modeling really is just to take, take us into the next chapter of the discovery of tone. <laughs> Everything you hear from the Variax comes from the player's fingers. What goes on in Variax is we take those six strings, convert them to digital, and effectively place those strings on a different guitar. So the guitar has regular pickups in it. So if you want to hear them buzz, it will. The analog part of it has its own personality, and then you have the fact that all the Variax guts inside can change it to another 26 different personalities. So um, you've got a manic depressive on your hands that you're playing. Here's kind of a Les Paul sound that's the standard, kind of a Marshall amplifier. Then another one, if you want the basic Fender. There's kind of that in-between Fender position. 12 string. So it's just a lot of variety. With the Variax, you've got a whole catalogue of guitars. So um, you can see how this fits in with my idea, because I'm not one guitarist, you know. I'm not one sound, I'm not one style. I do see a very as a very definitive way of being able to tour with just one guitar, but getting every sound I want. <laughs> then there's. You know, I mean, if you want big, obviously, just dial it up, you know. <laughs> I mean, the instruments that we all know and love? Les Paul thinks so. There seems to be no alternative at this time that we're going to go any other direction but digital, and it won't be analog. George Gruen doesn't. It's phony. It doesn't feel the same to the player, and it doesn't inspire the player to do the same thing. There's really no difference between the feel of a modeled instrument versus a real one. Even if the audience can't tell the tonal difference, if the musical ideas, the concepts, wouldn't have even occurred to the musician, if he wouldn't have composed that piece otherwise, 
then the instrument is critically important. Leo Fender got all kinds of criticism for his plank, this crazy piece of wood with these newfangled pickups on it. And because it was, it was just completely new, completely different. A guitar is something that's a, a sacred instrument, if you will. It's very important. And I would personally find the idea of a digital guitar about as interesting as a photograph of dinner to eat. Much the same as going out with a blow-up doll of a, that looks like a girl, it just means absolutely nothing. By its very nature, the electric guitar is forward-thinking and progressive. However, that exact same thing that made it so groundbreaking at the beginning is the same thing that creates classicists and people that do not want to change and want to immediately um, sort of hold things in awe and not be able to sort of progress. This is the time. This is the technolog technological age. So why stop dreaming now? You know, I'm still dreaming. I'm still dreaming that all of this will get better and better. This is all about musical exploration and that, that journey should never end. I believe that each guitar just has something locked in it that you just want to get out. You know, it, it sort of dictates how you want to play. For some reason, a melody or a theme comes to mind inspired by the instrument. If I pick up somebody's guitar or pick something off the wall, it's like a weird thing to me. It's like something new in your hands, and I almost always come up with a new riff on a new guitar. I've been my whole life dreaming of this sound that no one has heard, but I hear it in my head. We've all heard of the surfer's endless quest for the perfect wave. The guitarist's lifelong quest is to find his own tone, and it's just as elusive and personal. So where does tone come from? Is it the guitar or the fingers, the imagination, or the soul? Ten guitar players, line them up. They play the same exact blues like the same amp, the same guitar. You're gonna get 10 different sounds. So you're gonna really find out it's not a magic guitar. We toured with Van Halen. I got to put that to a test because Eddie would come up and play through my stuff and jam with us at sound checks or I would plug into his stuff. You know, he plugs into my amp, he sounds like Eddie Van Halen. I plug into his amp, I sound like me. Eric Clapton could play any instrument in the world. B.B. King could play any instrument in the world and you would know it's Eric Clapton and B.B. King. Tone is the reason that they're rock stars and I'm a congressman. Tone to me is a sound that pleases me. Don't ask me what it is. <laughs> All the things that affect tone are the wood, the placement of the pickups, the bridge, the type of bridge, the string gauge, the height of the pickup to the string. The uh, three things that, you know, I think tone is, is the guitar, the amp, and your fingers. If you have 10 fingers, then that's, you know, 12 things. How strong the magnets are, the type of coil that's in a pickup, how many turns, the pitch, how many layers per uh, turn that are put on it, how many turns per layer. Tone is the only part of music that makes sense in the entire universe. <laughs> And then you had the combination of potentiometers, the value of potentiometers, the neck, the frets, the fingerboard. Tone, for me, is a, a pleasurable sound. It's color. It has to be warm, a brightness in there as well. Uh, how strong the joints are between the neck and the body, uh, the placement of the tailpiece, either if it's a floating tremolo or if it's a solid bridge. Tone is how you imagine you will sound. What you hear, what you're looking for in, in a sound. But you're searching for it, you're trying to please your own ear. 
Especially in the end, what you play, you know, I mean, what notes you choose to play is all about tone as well. The, the finish is very important too. A lacquer finish will make your wood sound softer than a polyester finish, which will like brighten it up and sometimes muffle the sound of a, an actual guitar. What it really comes down to is, is your body and how it re reacts to the guitar you play. It's really the flash on the wood and the strings and some electricity running through it. Each instrument is going to give you a different tone, but the person playing it is going to put a tone into that instrument that is going to come out to the amplifier. Tone is your signature of what you feel, what comes out of your, of your belly. I think tone is basically what you feel in your soul. It's a combination of what you hear in your head that comes through your spirit and it's transmitted through your hands. their mood, it's their, their profile, it's their uh, upbringing, it's their, their whole karma, their whole aura about how they live their life. The thing about it is, is the thing that you seek and you hope that, hope that you can one day have is your own voice, an identifiable voice when somebody turns on your record and goes, oh, that's him. The best form of expression that I'm, that I'm capable of. That person that goes out and does the, the hour and a half gig, for that hour and a half, that's who I am more than any, at any other time. Are you ready to rock? Tonight, we got 13 real special bands for you. They work damn hard long to perform tonight. <laughs> Let's have fun and kick ass. That's it. Yeah. It feels incredible. Yeah. What a rush. I can totally understand why people get addicted to this. And... So how's it going to feel going back to real life tomorrow? It's going to suck. I, I definitely feel more like a rock star. I mean, it's about being on stage. That's what the, the culmination of this whole week is about. That's what everything is about. Nothing feels better than this. Nothing. I, I think when you strap on the guitar, you can do magic. <laughs> I'm gonna do this till I die, folks. A lot of people love the guitar. They're beautiful. They let you express your deepest emotions. They make you look cool. They could be a ticket to somewhere you want to go. And they change the world. But for me, I just love to play. Gotta find some tone of my own. <laughs> <laughs>